Good morning, good morning. Well, that's a nice thing to hear that there's no one you'd rather have me here and no place I'd rather be. It's always wonderful to be with Steve and Sarah and to be with you. I love the, uh, the indomitable spirit of joy in this church. I always sense it. And, and I, I look forward to every time that I am offered the opportunity to be here. This is a special Sunday for me to be here, however, and that is because uh, we came up a couple of days early to celebrate. Yesterday was my beautiful wife's birthday, so. <laughs> We've been married 53 years, and as of last night, she's finally able to vote. So thank God. It's great to be here. I, uh, I want to get right into the word this morning. It's going to be an un, maybe not an unusual sermon. It's going to be unusual for me. It's not my general approach to preaching. But I want to share with you, first of all, three passages of Scripture that on the surface may not seem to even connect. I hope that I can connect those dots for you. And then I want to... Uh, show you some historical things. But as I'm going through that, I don't want you to get to thinking, oh my, my God, this is just a, a history lecture. I, I hope by the end of that, you're also going to see what, what is being said. And, and I really do feel, and I, I think Steve said it better than I, I do feel that there is a word for you today. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those in turn, first of all, to the very last verse of the book of Judges. Judges 21 and 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, just pause a moment. To our American way of thinking, the fact that there was no king may seem good. And everybody, our individualism may make that verse sound wrong to us. That's not what it means. It means there was no presiding ethos over the nation. There was moral and spiritual confusion. Everybody made up his own rules. Sound familiar? Now turn, let's just turn the page to the book of Ruth, the first chapter and the fourth verse. And they, you'll see the first part there, and they, that means the sons of Naomi, a Jewish woman. She and her husband moved to Moab across the Jordan River uh, in order to flee um, the famine in Israel, and there they prospered, but then tragedy hit. Her husband died, then her sons died, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth, and they dwelled there about 10 years. Now, just turn a couple of pages to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived, and she bore a son and called his name Samuel, because I have asked him of the Lord. You just put your hand on your Bible and let's pray together. O Lord, with our hand upon the word and our hearts and minds as open as we know how to get them, we're asking that you do all the rest. Brush aside every barrier to divine communication. All of our carefully constructed mechanisms of self-defense rush into the inner self of us. Lord, we long for a word from you. Come, Holy Spirit. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God, Amen. Amen and amen. There's a national park ranger in Virginia and uh, worked in the Shenandoah National Park. Roy Sullivan was his name. He, he holds the world record. He was struck by lightning seven times. Does not make me want to visit the Shenandoah National Park. Not connected to that, I hope. Um, Mr. Sullivan later in 1983 committed suicide. Seven times struck by lightning. How unlikely is that? A woman named Ann Hodges in 1954 
was taking a nap on her couch in Alabama when a black rock burst through the roof and hit her in the hip. They took it to the scientists who analyzed it, and it was a meteorite. They said the, the likelihood of a meteorite striking a human being is one in every 9,000 years, not one in every 9,000 people. One in every 9,000 years. How unlikely is that? However, if you had told me that would happen, go through the roof and hit a woman asleep on the couch, I, I think I could have guessed it would happen in Alabama. <laughs> Husband and wife in Belmont, California in 2002 won two lotteries in the same day. They won $126,000 in Fantasy Five, whatever that is. And in the same day, $17 million in the super lotto. Those who compute odds on such things tell us that the odds of that happening are 1 in 24 trillion. How unlikely is that? And yet each of these is just, are just examples of random episodes of long odds events. What I want to speak today about is the God of the unlikely. That God somehow seems, as I read scripture, it seems apparent to me that God is a God who, who has a liking for the unlikely. Unlikely times when it seems the least likely that God would do something, show up, move, that he, he seems to love just those times. And in those times, chooses the, the most unlikely of instruments to accomplish the most unlikely of results. So look at these three passages from Judges, Ruth, and, and Samuel. All of those happen at about the same time. So the book of Ruth is, is co-historical with the, with the book of Judges. It happens during the period of the book of Judges. So here is this, here is this uh, season of national confusion. It, it is, there are the, the, the judges, the giants of judges, Gideon and Jephthah and Barak and Deborah and, and the rest of them, but they are, they are gradual and momentary eruptions of God's grace in a rapidly declining Israeli society. Until finally the end of the book of Judges is, is even painful to read. These horrible stories of profound moral confusion that, that, that don't, even, uh, don't even make any sense. It's the unlikeliest of times. Until so, so the, the Jewish people are fighting with each other. They descend, they descend into terrible tribalism. There is the, the terrible battle where Jephthah and the people of Gilead intercept the people of Ephraim as they try to flee back across the Jordan River. And the Gileadites take the ford. And so the, the Ephraimites are going to try to not be, they're not wearing uniforms, so they think they can blend in. But the Ephraimites have an, an accent. They, they don't speak Hebrew. They're all speaking Hebrew. But the, the people from Ephraim have an accent. They can't say words that begin with S-H. So the, the, the Gileadites choose a word, Shibboleth, which has now become a, a word even in the English language. A Shibboleth. Because the people from Ephraim can't say S-H. When they try to say it, it comes out Shibboleth. So they say to them, just say, if you, you claim to be you claim to be from Gilead? Okay, fine. Say Shibboleth. When it comes out Shibboleth, they kill them. And they kill 42,000, 42,000 of their fellow Jews. That the tribalism that just sets in and separates people it happens in the church. We're the tribe of Methodists. We're the tribe of Baptists. We're from independent churches. We don't know what tribe we're in. We're all, all that. It happens at every level. And in a pandemic like this, got the tribe of the masks, the tribe of the non-masks, the tribe of the tribe of the Republicans, the tribe of the Democrats, the tribe of the pandemics, the tribe of, 
on and on and on. And, on. and the problem is we, we kill each other over it. So there is, a, there is a real sense of identification with the end of the book of Judges. It's an unlikely time for God to do anything. So he reaches into an unlikely instrument. Here is a Jewish woman in a foreign country. Her husband dies, then both of her sons die, and they are married to Gentiles. So she says to the Gentile daughters-in-law, "Go, I, I release you, go home and go on back to Israel. One of them, Orpah, does that. But this other one, Ruth, she makes this famous speech. You all know it. Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will judge. I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God shall be my God. I, I, I've been to weddings where the bride and groom say that to each other. That's not biblical. You want to use that in a wedding? Let the bride turn around and say it to her mother-in-law. See how that works. So Naomi, this Jewish widow, returns to Bethlehem with, not with nothing, with worse than nothing. She's got no money, she's got no future, she's got no husband, she's got no sons, and she's got this Gentile daughter-in-law stuck to the bottom of her shoe like bubble gum. But that daughter-in-law is the instrument through which God will preserve and further the DNA that will lead first three, gen four generations later to King David and eventually a thousand years later to Jesus of Nazareth. That God says, I, I, need, I need just the right DNA to mix in to produce the Messiah. I know what I'll use. A Gentile woman in a foreign country who's the daughter-in-law of an angry and bitter widow. Perfect. <laughs> Unlikely. And then there is, at the end of the book of Judges, there is this spiritual confusion. The high, the high priest, Eli, his sons are corrupt. There is... Sexual immorality, all kinds of evil, everything. And there is a barren woman that, that is pleading for a child. And God says, I, I need to raise up a prophet. I can't look in the temple. I can't look among the priesthood. Where is this prophet going to come from that will leap the gap from the book of Judges to the life and leadership of King David? I know in the womb of a barren woman who gives birth to Samuel, who anoints a little boy in the same village where Ruth is, Bethlehem. And that little boy becomes King David. It's unlikely. You pick any time in, in Israeli history almost for God to show up mighty with prophetic power and kingly authority, it's not going to be the end of the book of Judges. So I, I, I want to bring that into a historical context. Now, now listen to this as I start this. It, it's important. I'm neither a prophet nor the child of a prophet. But, but I can, I think I can track the footsteps of God through history. He does this there and it looks like that and then this there and it looks like that and he does this there and it looks like that. If he does, then... Maybe I can see how he might operate in a day such as ours of such confusion and tribalism and hurt and anger and division. So, in England in 1738, England was in horrible shape. It was the height of what is called the gin craze. You may not be familiar with it, but it was the first major international drug craze. Gin is certainly an alcoholic beverage, which is a drug, alcohol is a drug, but it hit England in a, in a fury. And 1738, they tell us that the average English person, including men, women, children, babies, everything, if you took all of that, the average, cons the average consumption, annual consumption of gin was 2.2 gallons a year per person, irrespective of age. 
in London, there were 7,000 gin bars in the city of London alone. Look at Ken Hutchison tells us that the most common street sign in London in 1738 was get drunk here for a penny. 7,000 gin bars in a city of 650,000 people, 1738, London's population. I have done the math, and whether you want to take my word for the math, you might want to check with my high school algebra teacher, but that is one in every 92 people. For one in every 92 people, there's a gin bar in, in London, 1738. The city of Atlanta, near where I live, is six million people. Taking that same percentage, it would mean that right now, there would need, in order to compute, let's compute that in terms of crack houses, there would need to be 65,217 crack houses in the city of Atlanta. The, the, it's almost mind-boggling. You can't even think of such a thing. Of course, that level of addiction led to robbery, prostitution, disease, violence of every kind, and a vast proliferation of child prostitution, trafficking children for sex. It's going to be an unlikely time for anything much to happen. For, for England to even be saved. In the midst of that, the clergy are, are completely more, the Church of England clergy, moribund, impotent. The most commonly preached on passage of Scripture in the Church of England in 1738 was do all things in moderation. Oh, there's a revival passage. <laughs> Unlikely for anything to happen. Come to the United States. 1798, the post-revolutionary war America. The Revolutionary war is over, the Constitution signed, the government is set up. But in the Wild West, the Wild West, remember 1798, the Wild West is not Arizona, it's Tennessee, it's Kentucky. In the Wild West, the post-revolutionary war United States has descended into, into chaos. Alcoholism, the poor are being crowded out by avaricious land grabbers. Sexual promiscuity is everywhere. The lack of churches, lack of clergy, lack of preaching, violence. The roads in Tennessee and Kentucky in 1798 are dangerous because of armed robbery, the proliferation of armed robbery. So it's, it's unthinkable that anything much could ever happen. More unlikely time for any kind of an awakening would be 1798 in the western territories of the new United States. Come a little bit closer. One that some of you will remember, as I do. 1967, in the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco, the height of the hippie world. Everybody thinks that this is the first time we've ever had any separation or division or riots in the United States. My beautiful wife who sits on the front row, and I was at the University of Maryland in 1967. My wife was working at the administration building. And I got word that the riots on the University of Maryland campus because of the Kent State massacre, the state police and the National Guard had to come and escort them out of the administration building because they burned the administration building down. I was terrified that my wife was inside. 1967, the hippies ruled in the Haight-Ashbury district. Remember the summer of love? You're going to San Francisco. Be sure to wear some flowers in your hair because you're going to find some loving people there. The only thing is they didn't find loving people. They went for the summer of love and they didn't find loving people. They found the Zodiac Killer. And they found veteran pimps that turned teenage girls into street walking prostitutes and invented a disease called AIDS. It was an, a disaster. San Francisco was a disaster in 1967. An unlikely place for anything much to happen. Was it just the kinds of seasons in life and history, where God says, That's, this is a perfect time. I, I, I want to give you a, it's a dreadful anthropomorphism, but just relax a little bit. I'm not, I'm not, trying, to, I'm not trying to be heretical here, but I, I, 
Sometimes I fantasize of God standing on the parapet of heaven, looking at the mass of humanity and its sinfulness, looking for the perfect instrument. And the angels are behind God. And God says, I see the one I want. There he is. And the angels all go, oh, he's good. In these unlikely seasons of history, who did God choose? 1738, at the height of the gin craze, the Church of England, impotent and powerless to confront the collapsing British economy, the collapsing British morality. There's a, there's a failed missionary who is in a ship on the way home from the British colony of Georgia. He, he went to Georgia to be a missionary to the Indians. He never saw an Indian. They made him a pastor of a, of a church, Church of England church in Savannah. And it was a disaster. It ended in such libelous disaster that he had to flee through the swamp to his brother, who is the private secretary for General Oglethorpe, the founder of the colony, and his brother Charles. And General Oglethorpe put him on a ship back to England Total disaster of a missionary. He writes in his diary on the ship home, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who will convert me? He's collapsed. He's ruined. Five foot six inches tall. God, I love knowing that. <laughs> Hurts me when you laugh at me. High-pitched nasal voice. A legalist, almost obsessive, compulsive in nature, and a failed missionary home from America with his tail between his legs. And God says, that's my man. That's who I'm going to choose, John Wesley. That's the guy I want. And the angels all go, yeah, yeah. Good, Lord. That's who we were thinking. An unlikelier instrument than John Wesley can hardly be imagined. In the unlikeliest time, at the height of the gin craze, with England collapsing under the weight of its drug addiction, alcoholism, and immorality, and a, and a clergy that was impotent to say anything to it prophetically. And God raises up this little guy and shakes the world. The revival under John Wesley didn't just change England, it changed the world. The first great worldwide revival since the second chapter of Acts. In the unlikeliest time, the unlikeliest place, and the unlikeliest instrument. What about America in 1798? The wild and woolly American frontier. God says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring an awakening to America. Where, who do I choose? I, some preacher from a great church in Boston. No. Some, some great, great uneducated and anointed preacher from Harvard. No, God says, I will reach into little tiny villages in Kentucky and Tennessee, little churches in villages with exciting names like Muddy River and Clay Lick. That's where I want to see a revival start. And Cane Ridge. And the Cane Ridge revival, the awakening that hit the American frontier and swept all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, one of the great moves of God in American history. So that in remote frontier America, there were massive gatherings. Nobody can even explain how everybody got there. This was nothing. There was no internet. 20,000 people gathered nightly at Cane Ridge. The power of God hit like a tornado. Unlikely time for anything much to happen in an unlikely place and an unlikelier instrument. A little tiny church in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Or what about 1967 in the Haight-Ashbury District of San Francisco? God is looking at angry, hurt, wounded, rebellious, dirty, teenage hippies with their bare feet and their bell bottoms. And God says, perfect. This is perfect. 
The angels say, well, Lord, it's perfect. Who's the instrument? He says, them. Hippies. I'm going to change America with hippies. <laughs> Don't you know the angel said, well, mm. And the explosion of conversion among the hippies through churches like Calvary Chapel and others, the West Coast, the power of God hit and they created a commodity that had never existed before, the Jesus people, which gave birth to the charismatic renewal movement of which I am a child and without which, trust me, this church right here does not exist. The power of God in the unlikely time you look over the whole span of American history, I can't think of a more unlikely place than 19 time than 1967, a more unlikely place than California. And a more unlikely group of people than the hippies. God, God has worked that way throughout the history and throughout the Bible. God says... My people have been in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. They've lost faith. They've lost hope. How long do you wait for deliverance? A year? A decade? A century? Two centuries? How about four and a half centuries? God says now's the perfect time. They're completely demoralized, have no hope of liberty. They've been enculturated into Egypt until they no longer even know my name. And God says, this is the perfect moment. Then the angels say, Lord, who are you going to send? God says, oh, I forgot my eye on a guy. He's an 80-year-old man living on the backside of the Midianite desert. He's been there for 40 years. He's got a price on his head in Egypt because the last time he was there, he committed voluntary manslaughter. That's the guy. Perfect. Moses. Not only that, when he calls Moses, Moses says, Lord, all right, I'll go, I'll go. Can you give me some kind of some symbol of authority and power. Something. I'm going to stand up to Pharaoh and the Egyptian empire. Give me something. And God says, what is that in your hand? And Moses says, stick. Is it like, it's a stick. God says, perfect. An 80-year-old man with a price on his head and a stick in his hand. This is my answer. With it, God defeated an empire, humbled, an, uh, humbled a pharaoh, and drowned an army. Unlikely time, unlikely instruments, and unlikely results. First century church, struggling to overcome its sectarianism, God has ordered it over and over again, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and they can't get off Solomon's porch in Jerusalem. God says, I need somebody to take the gospel of grace and salvation by faith alone to the Gentile world so that the wild branch can be grafted in. I need somebody that can carry the, the gospel to Gentiles who can love them and, and strengthen them and encourage them and build a church throughout the world. And he says, I've got just exactly the right person. Here's a guy named Saul of Tarsus who is contributing to the death of the first Christian martyr and who hates Gentiles, hates Christians, hates believers so badly that he's got letters from the chief priest to go all the way to Syria and arrest the believers in Damascus and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. And God said, there's my man. That's just the guy I need. Don't, don't, you see, don't you see what this says to us? Is this not an unlikely time for God to do anything in America? We are divided, hurting, wounded, angry. People are afraid. They're terrified about their economy. They're terrified about their fortunes. They're separated into tribes. We're on the verge of a political election that threatens to rupture this country like nothing since the second election of Lincoln. It just looks terrifying. 
And God says, is it not possible that God says, this is just what I've been waiting on? So then the second question is, what, what would be the instrument? I, I, I tell you, I, I've said this, I'm not a prophet, I'm not making a prophetic statement here. I, I'm just helping you to see how God has worked. Maybe we can see how God might work. God might say to himself, I, I need an instrument, the perfect instrument to preach the the gospel of racial reconciliation and unity and the end of tribalism. I need somebody that can love with a great love, that can teach love with a great love. And he looks into some KKK training camp where he sees some ignorant backwoods peckerwood shooting an AK-47 at a target and he said, there's my man. That's who I need. The voice of racial reconciliation. And the angel said, well, it's Perfect, perfect Lord. We had our eye on him. Well, God says, I need someone to preach a gospel of renewed respect, the dignity of the human being, unity, and the power of God in a renewed and refreshed republic. Where can I find such a voice? And he looks into a a riot in some Pacific Northwest community where some Antifa thug is beating a cop with a skateboard and he says, I'll take him. How do we know? But what that crazy, angry thug with a skateboard may not be the next prophetic instrument of God to lead America back to Christ. We don't know. I'm not, I'm not prophesying it. I'm only saying that's exactly the kind of thing that God would do. Oh. Still the question remains, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to us? Maybe God looks at the likes of us and he sees some Frightened businessman, terrified that everything he's built with his whole life is fixing to go up in smoke. And he says, I've got just the right guy to speak a word of faith and confidence and boldness to demoralize people. Maybe he looks at some woman who's trying to figure out how to hold her job and homeschool her kids. And, and she's got a deadbeat husband that won't pay his child support. and Terrified the take back man's coming for the car in the morning. God says, that's, that's just the woman I've been looking for. I'm just saying that if you analyze history, those moments where you think God might move that seem likely may not be the moments at all. The moments where it seems the most unlikely, it seems like those are the times when God wants to show himself powerful. And God looks into the humanity and he says, I choose them. I choose them. The angel said, Lord, they're weak. They are childish. They're fleshy. They, they, are, they are not heroes. They're just common, ordinary people just trying to figure their lives out. And God says, perfect. It is unlikely, frankly, that God could use the likes of us in this unlikely time. And that makes it almost predictable. How? Why? Well, the whole answer is because it has nothing to do with the times or with us. The stick didn't choose Moses and Moses didn't choose God. It has to do with the greatness of God. That God is still a God of miracles. God doesn't pick the newspaper up. He, he's not reading the New York Times and I know what's going on. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Trust me, he's not reading the Times. <laughs> no, he's a, no, history is not happening to God. When we are shaken, he is not. 
God is great. It's such a simple statement. God is great. God is powerful. God is a God who can and still does miracles. God is a God who loves to, loves to show up powerful in unlikely moments. Take a stick in his hand and part a river and drown an army. Our God is a great God, and he's still God. Will you bow your heads? <clears throat> bow your heads and close your eyes all over the room. I just, before we close, I just want to offer, I'm offering to pray with you. David said, almost my foot had given away and I'd let go. I just, I'd almost slid in. If you would say, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? I, I almost lost hope. I almost got so afraid. I almost got so shaken by what's going on around me. It just seems so unlikely that anything good could come of this. Will you pray for me that God would strengthen me and restore my faith and renew my hope? If that's you, then you just lift your hand up and take it right back down, and I want to pray for you. Good, good, yes, sure. Why not? The day we live in, why not? Why wouldn't we be shaken? Why wouldn't we be terrified? Sure, raise your hand and just take it back down. And say, that's, I need that prayer. I need that. I need my faith renewed. Yes, yes. Heavenly Father, you see our hands, our hearts before you. For us, for our nation, for our world, for our children, for our grandchildren, oh God. We feel shaken. And yet we know you are great. You are great. You do miracles. You are great. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd la like to invite you to just pray out loud with me simply. Talk to God. Say, you are great. Just say it. You are great. Just open your mouth and say it. You are great. You are great. You are so great. Go on. Open your mouth and say it. You are great. Talk to God. You're great. You're great. Remind him of his miracle working power. Say it. You do miracles. You do miracles. You're a God of miracles. You're great. You do miracles, oh God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Now let's stand all over the room and celebrate that as we worship God. You are great. You do miracles. Come on, lift your hands and let's praise him tonight. to invite you. If you're not comfortable with it, don't do it. But why don't you lift both your hands and just sing to God. Worship Him for a minute. Sing to Him. You're great. You do miracles. Go on. Proclaim Him. Proclaim Him. Get your eyes off the moment and off America and off what we're facing and off a pandemic. Get your eyes on Him. You're great. You do miracles. Go on and praise Him. Come on.
before Steve comes, look right up here, will you? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to stand you before his presence without fault and with unspeakable joy, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before time ever began, right now and throughout all the ages to come. Fear nothing save God himself. And when the battle's over, we'll all wear a crown. I know you were clapping because that was a good word. Now can we clap for the prophet of God who brought us the word of God today? Thank you, God. Ladies, we want you to come Wednesday night to worship and to pray and to believe God to move mightily. Men, we want you to come Friday night to worship, to pray, to hear the word of God. We need it. We need it. We need God. The church needs God. The nation needs God. We need God. We need him more than we realize we need him. Why don't you work on being nice to people this week? Why don't you work on loving somebody? Quit trying to win an argument and win a soul. Quit trying to convert people to your puny opinion about puny non-eternal things. And love somebody. Pray for somebody. Encourage somebody. We need God. Let's chase him hard this week. Let's love God and love people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.